So, um, you know, just to uh, talk a little bit about what, you know, in addition to what Felicia uh, talked, I mean, you know, for the last several summits, we always talked about emergency water conservation programs needed to deal with the drought. And, uh, you know, our agencies uh, really recognized the drought very early in the cycle and did a very good, you know, very good measures, emergency measures to really deal with the drought. But we really believe that it's time to move beyond emergency conservation uh, uh, plans. It is time to stop looking at water supply as a cyclical issue. Uh, you know, we, it's time to stop looking to the north and to the east and, and, and whether, whether, whether there is enough rain or whether there is enough snow. I mean, really, we need to look at it in a more sustainable, long-term way. Uh, so we need to invest in long-term solutions to create water supply systems uh, that are uh, sustainable uh, and uh, long-term. The questions for us are, what are the best practice solutions to bolster our local water resources and uh, adapt 21st century efficiency improvements to ensure uh, we are using our water resources in a sustainable way? Uh, what are other, you know, it would be interesting to understand what other cities, states, or countries do. Uh, how can the public and private industries come together uh, on this issue? Uh, this is really, when you start looking at this, it's really a combination of adapting new systems, adapting new, new technologies, uh, continuing to pass new regulations, uh, and a continuous education until we create really a cultural shift. Uh, I tell people that I come from a country that, uh, you know, water is part of our cultural understanding. I mean, we, as kids in kindergarten, we learned jingles or songs that had to do with how every drop is important. So for us, as we grow, you know, we, you know as we get older, in, you know, it's not, water is not a fight between one group or another. It's not an issue of uh, somebody, you know, of money or not money. It's really a security, a needed, a needed, a needed component. Uh, and I think that that's where we need also to get to get here. Uh, so we need, what we want to do today is, uh, is, uh, is in some cases start, in other cases continue this kind of conversation. And we have a panel here, we have a panel from the public sector, from the private sector, uh, that together I think it will be a, an excellent group to do so, to start that conversation. So what I want to do is uh, I want to uh, uh, introduce the panel. Um, uh, you have, in, you know, you have the bios in, in your packets, but uh, let me just introduce them by, by names. Uh, to my left, Gil Crosses is Senior Vice President of Corolla Engineers. Uh, next, Virginia Gerbian is the Chief of Staff for Parson Cooperation. Uh, <coughs> Jeffrey, uh, Kite Linger is the general manager of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. To his left is uh, Rob Nicholas, is vice president and general manager of Peer Performance Solution for Veolia. Uh, James Villeneuve is uh, the Council General of Canada in Los Angeles. And uh, Enrique Zaldivar is the general manager for the Los Angeles Department of Sanitation. Uh, and we all met. Felicia. Uh, we, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, you know, start by uh, having everybody present. We'll ask a question, have everybody uh, pres uh, uh, answer and uh, uh, present for a few minutes, and then uh, and then we'll continue later on with uh, with uh, group group questions. And I want to and I want to start with uh, the public sector and ask both uh, Jeff and Enrique to talk about. You know, what strategies are your agencies employing to move beyond conservation uh, toward more long-term solution, increase local water supplies, and to use uh, the resources we have more efficiently? And Jeff, let's, let's start with you. Sure, thank you very much. So, uh, I'm Jeff <coughs> Keitlinger, the General Manager of Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, and, you know, in case you're not aware of it, that's pretty much where most of your water comes from. We <laughs> We bring water from two main places, and that's the Colorado River and Northern California. And those two aqueducts travel uh, 250 miles from the Colorado River from Northern California. That water travels about 400 miles to get here. 
And those two sources make up about 60% of all of Southern California's water, anywhere between 50 and 60%. And every day we deliver about 2 billion gallons of water every single day. So that is the water supply that really is the backbone of Southern California. Uh, but when you look at it a little historically, uh, 1900 was the first look to import water, and that was the Owens Valley. 1930, we developed the Colorado River Aqueduct. 1960, we developed the State Water Project. And in 1990, we ran out of water and for the first time had to ration water throughout Southern California. Basically, every 30 years, we've had to go out and get a new supply based on our growth. Each generation had to go out and do that. Uh, what I thought was amazing when you look backwards is in 1990, the decisions that Southern California made, realizing we're not going to get a new supply, and that we had to actually kind of reinvent how we looked at water and how we managed it in Southern California. We've gone essentially a generation since 1990, and we are importing about 25% less water than we did in 1990. We've added 5 million people. We've grown from 14 to 19 million people. And we've done all that through conservation, recycling, reclaiming water, uh, restoring our groundwater basins. And so we've proven we can do this. We've done it for 25 years in this fashion. Uh, the trick is now to keep doing it forever. California, uh, we serve one in every two Californians. That's one in every 16 Americans here in Southern California. 19 million people out of 38. California is going to go to 50 million people in about 15 to 20 years. And Southern California is slated to go to 25 million people. So we have to keep up this path and keep doing it. Uh, we have some exciting plans on the, and, you know, on the horizon, like working with the LA County Sand District that uh, Felicia mentioned to build the largest recycling uh, plant on the West Coast. We've done some huge things in trying to transform our landscape out here. In the last two years, we spent $450 million. Uh, typically, we spend $20 million a year on conservation devices taking out turf. Uh, we put that on steroids for the drought and went from $40 million in our two-year budget to $450 million in our two-year budget. Uh, but, but you're seeing you know, an exciting transformation take place. So it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of effort. We need to hang on to those backbone um, uh, supplies that are imported, but we need to really continue to develop our local supplies to manage through this. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, an interesting time for a department like mine, Department of Sanitation, who had uh, traditionally been in the regulated business of treating wastewater. Uh, it's an incredible transformation over the last few years, and certainly in the last three years under the leadership of Mayor Garcetti. Uh, uh, what a role has been in partnership now with the Department of Water and Power, where we, in fact, have come to think of ourselves as a producer of water. In fact, we are a producer of water uh, in two fronts. Uh, uh, Felicia sort of had a, uh, uh, a moment of enlightened me effect, uh, of enlightened me on me uh, when I first heard her speak of the effects of global warming and the snowpack. The snow, snowpack being the traditional storage reservoir, if you will, for the water supply of, of the state and how now uh, the ground needed to be that new storage place. That sort of opened up my vision on our role in stormwater, because that, similarly to what we had played um, in wastewater, we had, had um, all of our vision wrapped around a regulatory mm -hmm. purpose, cleaning it up, but very often putting it right back into a uh, a creek, put it right back into the storm drain. That didn't make sense. So after I heard uh, Felicia talk about how the ground needed to be that new storage, uh, having lost the snowpack, I said, well, wait, that is a whole different calling for us in sanitation. In line with the mayor's strategy to increase the local water supplies, you heard about his um, directive to reduce the import of water by 50% by 2025. That's an incredible, uh, ambitious vision. And we're very much part of it. 
So I think we have gone clearly beyond conservation, Jacob. Uh, I think we have embraced a new concept that really calls on a different calling that want water, that all water is want water, whether it's stormwater, whether it's recycled water, whether it's uh, rainwater. And if you think it in its most profound meaning, it really it, it has a different effect on all of us. So that's how we're being guided now um, in this new strategy looking toward the future. I think it's important that we learn from uh, other parallels in the energy sector. It was fascinating being part of the earlier uh, discussions on the energy sector, how the People. markets can help drive the water system as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, uh, thanks, Enrique. Gil, you are working with Corolla engineers at the, the center of several new partnerships between leading, leading agencies in the greater Los Angeles area uh, to implement critical water supply projects. Uh, you know, tell us the significance of these new inter, interagency partnerships and what led local and regional agencies to take this approach. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Obviously, the goals are very lofty in terms of uh, building a local, resilient, and sustainable water supply. So the old paradigm of uh, everybody working in a very comfort zone of silos, and, and by the way, this existed in our firm too. We had our wastewater people that were just fine working in a separate office and branch from the water people, and et cetera. Well, this, this is changing because of the goals there, and uh, everything has been said so far is, is, a, is a main driver. And I would say the partnerships, they can act or be enhanced at many levels, within the city, within the organization, at the regional level, and then again between private and public. So within the city, I think the One Water LA uh, planning effort for the 2040 horizon is a, is a great example where um, to, to re maximize water recycling, you need different departments to work together. To maximize stormwater capture, you have other departments that need to also work together. And, and actually, the One Water LA plan involves 16 departments, if you can imagine that. But of, of the 16, clearly the uh, LA Sanitation and then LA DWP are the two uh, key um, departments co coordinating efforts under the leadership of the city. So that's, that's a great example within an organization. At the regional level, <clears throat> I can take a couple of examples, stormwater capture, I mean, uh, to maximize this at the centralized scale, there's already existing strong relationships and partnerships between, say, the city of LA and the county of LA, which is the stormwater control um, agency. But to maximize this at the decentralized level, we're going to need more partnerships, not only the the, the, the organizations that deal with it every day, but other partners, like maybe the schools, the universities, the landowners, uh, and I think this is building. Jeff mentioned the, uh, the mega partnership between uh, LA County Sanitation Districts and uh, MWD. I think there's probably room to grow that, that uh, regional approach to, uh, to um, uh, central, I mean, to a more massive, significant uh, wastewater recycling. And again, within this paradigm shift, there's sub-trends, like uh, Purple Pipe was the way to go. And now we're realizing that it's probably a, a more efficient way to, um, uh, if, if a groundwater basin is available, to treat to a higher level, inject it in the ground, let the groundwater basin distribute it, and reuse it again. Thirdly, I mentioned the public-private partnership. And, and uh, when this comes up, usually the mind goes, at least my mind goes, to you know, very uh, wealthy, large private corporations that can bring a lot of technology and money and solve the municipal problems. Well, this is possible in, in places, but I think there's other types of partnerships. Um, speaking about uh, sustainability, I think corporations have sustainability goals of their own. They're trying to achieve them. Um, there's quite an enthusiasm and a trend we have all seen in the industries, but I think it's important they achieve their own goals in a way that is consistent with the municipal regional management of water. And an example is it's very tempting for an industry, let's say, to do their on-site wastewater recycling because they want to have their credits to tell their boss they've done it. And in parallel, we have cities working really hard to do semi-regional recycling programs. So I think we need to strengthen these partnerships 
So when there is a recycling program locally, we can give credit to a public, I mean, to a private entity to, to uh, actually show that they are achieving their goals. I mean, we're all talking about coordination. I mean, this is, you know, really a different conversation that we've, you know, mm -hmm. that we used to have in the past. I mean, all the agencies, you know, we're talking to water, sanitation, you know, everybody coming together. So this is really a very, a very important part of, of the programs that, that we are developing. I want to move uh, to the private sector. I mean, you know, we had the public, we had Gil kind of transitioning between the public and the private. And uh, we'd like to talk about uh, you know, par uh, private-public partnerships and, you know, applications of uh, new technologies that are being put to use in, <clears throat> in other places or uh, around the globe to develop uh, smarter and more sustainable water systems. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Virginia and Rob uh, to, uh, to talk about ideas uh, that they are working with. Virginia, maybe we'll start with you. Par Parsons works f uh, all over the world uh, with uh, governments, municipalities, and private industries on wide range of uh, complex water projects, uh, uh, what recommendation would you suggest uh, for alternative delivery mechanism and project financing, including public-private partnerships that the state should consider? Absolutely, and um, think, oh, I, I have three quick slides. Let me get the, well, yeah. 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 Um, oh. To help ground us in the conversation, I guess. Um, yeah, by the way, if anybody wants to use slides, there is a, <laughs> there, so, is a there is a clicker. That we there's use. a clicker. <laughs> um, so take the conversation briefly in a little bit of a different direction, which is we've had all this collaboration, we've come together, we've been really creative, we've changed our channel, we've thought about all kinds of different ways to increase and develop our water supplies because at the end of the day, what do we want? We want resilient, sustainable communities for our state, right? But when you come up with a great plan, you actually have to, at the end of the day, you have to implement it. And I love Felicia, your word. Uh, it's a, a panel of implementers. And what's uh, interesting in the industry is we get very, very creative, as you've heard about all these alternative water supplies and approaches, and then we tend to revert back in time 100 years to our traditional methods of implementing and building project. And the traditional method is what's called design, bid, build. So we get the engineers in a room, they design it. Heaven forbid they talk to the operator, right? So the engineer mm -hmm. designs it. Then we go out through a competitive procurement process through a low uh, bid uh, procedure and we hire a contractor and then he builds it. That process is relatively uncollaborative. It puts people in boxes, it puts people in roles, and it puts people defending their position and defending that they're performing to the specifications that they have bid to or developed. So what's the alternative? And the alternative is a, a partnership. And there are many different approaches, and, and a lot of people, when you talk about alternative delivery and, and, and public-private partnerships, immediately focus on the money. So I want, us, I want to not focus on the money for a minute and just focus on what a public-private partnership can do, what an alternative delivery mechanism can do for the industry. And at the end of the day, what it is is a partnership. It's about bringing entities together, not only the planners and the developers of, of a project, but the folks who are actually going to turn the dirt and construct it for you, and put them in together in a business relationship that's different than what you've had before, that looks at life cycle operation costs, that enables the public sector to retrain control of assets. How do you do this? You have to talk a different language than what we've normally been talking about, and you have to look at different characteristics. So when you're looking at, and these are just three examples, uh, there is a plethora of options that you can implement in an alternative delivery approach. And that's what's so neat about alternative delivery, is you can custom craft an implementation solution that is tailored to the specific needs of your agency, your community, and your project. So I have on the left the traditional approach, and I have on the right the fully integrated public-private partnership where you, you uh, bring in private uh, financing. But there's a number of different options in between. But what you really need to do is you need to sit down and you need to have a conversation about timing. 
What's important to you? How quickly does, does, should this project be completed? Um, the cost of the project, the risk of the project, and I have here some project specifications of typical projects of what fits in these different categories. The most important thing in alternative delivery is having a conversation about risk. And risk means different things to different people. And that's where the conversation tends to break down between the public sector and the private sector. When the public sector thinks about risk, they're primarily coming from a frame of reference of stakeholder risk. Mm -hmm. How do I get all of the different entities interested in this project satisfied with the project, right? When the private sector thinks about risk, we're coming from a frame of reference of project execution and delivery risk. It's a completely different conversation, and we have to work together to have a conversation that makes sense to all parties. So risk is the probability that something bad will happen, that at the end of the day will cost money. And that bad thing could be you leave out a stakeholder group, right, and you completely miss an element of the project, and so you have to go back and restart the project all over again, you lose time and you lose money. Alternatively, the risk could be that the means and methods for constructing the, the uh, piece of infrastructure is improperly identified, and we have to come back and figure out a different way to make it work. So uh, the conversation about risk is really important. Real quick, I'm just gonna jump to uh, uh, this slide. And this is the, the fundamental, in my opinion, uh, rationale for partnerships. When you look at traditional delivery, we absolutely define the capital costs. We know how much it's gonna cost. It's gonna be $100 million. It's gonna uh, cost us this much money to uh, operate it. And at the end of the day, the public agency is responsible for the complete totality of making that project work over the life of that project. The public sector retains all of the risk. If you go to an alternative delivery, you could work with your project implementer, with your uh, construction company, with your designer, to look at, in a partnership, ways to reduce costs. So for example, I was just at uh, Las Vegas earlier in this week, Southern Nevada Water Authority. They're building a $750 million uh, pump station, actually $650 million, I apologize, pump station. Very, very challenging, very, very unique. They're using an alternative delivery model. Why did they want to do it? They have to build 34 um, uh, shafts in this pump station, uh, submersible pumps, one-of-a-kind, only-kind pumps, uh, very unique in, in the world, and there's some very challenging site conditions that are making them have to go through some unique means and methods approach. So they hired the designer, they hired the contractor, they brought them together in alternative delivery mechanisms, and they collaborated together on the means and methods to construct this. What did they end up doing? They ended up hiring a drill bore from the coal industry because he brought different and unique approach that enabled them to drastically reduce their costs and actually come up with a schedule that met their time frame. So those types of bringing all the players together to look at how you can develop the project so uh, that ultimately you have reduced capital costs, you have reduced own, own, own M costs, you have more flexibility, and when you do that, the risks retained by the public sector tend to be smaller. So you're getting value for your money in this process. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good information. Um, so, uh, Rob, Virginia discussed project delivery. Uh, maybe you can talk to us about uh, information technologies being deployed uh, here and around the U.S. to make our water system smarter. Maybe you can even tell us what is a smart water system. Is <laughs> <laughs> that the clicker? Yes. All right, yeah, we're good. Well, good afternoon. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about smart water. Earlier in the day, we heard some people talk about smart cities, smart electric grids. Smart water has to happen there, too. Um, we at Veolia deal in day-to-day -day management of water, energy, and waste systems. Um, one of the things we're finding out is there's a plethora of new ideas that can come with all the data. Problem is, a lot of water systems are dumb. 
So to give an example, there's all these lines out there. You know, there's thousands of miles of water lines who are lying out in the system. The problem is we collect very little data. Mm. Um, reason being is, in the old days, um, it really wasn't a concern. There was ample supply, there was no problem treating it, leaky pipes weren't an issue. That's not the case today. You, you already saw the shrinking snow cap and there's something that needs to be done. The way the information was collected in a, a distribution system for water was you had a water meter at everybody's house. And those meters were read maybe four times a year. So you had four readings about what the consumer was doing with the water. Even if you had 100,000 customers, well, you know, that's only 400,000 readings. What we're finding out, though, is by having a smart water system, you can do it different. If you have a smart water meter in your house, that meter is connected through the cell phone or through a radio tower to the central office and produces information. It produces 35,000 reads per year. Now, that's a whole lot different than having four to 12 reads. There's all kinds of things about behavior, um, how water's used, what we can do with it from that standpoint. So that's one of the things we're seeing is, leaks are unacceptable, so we need to get information. Besides having a smart water meter, all of a sudden you can have a smart leak detector. It's possible to have 1,000 or 2,000 devices in the system listening for leaks, so that the minute the pipe cracks a little bit, you know a leak starts and you can monitor that and you can manage the system much more better. You can decide to fix it immediately. If it's near a hospital or, or a, a busy intersection, you can send a crew immediately. Um, if it's one where you can wait, you can pre-plan and take care of that. But all that information all of a sudden adds up to great efficiency and you're not wasting <laughs> resources um, on things you shouldn't be. You can all of a sudden have very clear data about it. Um, but what happens is, it's paragram shift. All of a sudden you go from, again from four readings a year to all of a sudden you've got billions of pieces of information. But that's the gold mine. Veolia, working with IBM, we've developed what we call a smart water box. Think of it as an app for your phone. It is to help communities and utilities take the information and turn it into a usable product. One of those things is, is it opens up all these what-if scenarios. So if you have all this data, even though water systems are run well, you could have 10% water uh, loss. What happens if you can get the nine? I mean, that could be a great opportunity. With all this data, you can use it. If you're trying to have a homeowner use less water, use water not at the peak of the day, you all of a sudden have information that tells you the habits of all your citizens. Um, it's amazing what happened in L.A. I listened this morning to the 19% reduction in usage. But with more data, can you get to 30% or 40%? Um, can you better manage the data? And so that's what this is looking at, is trying to get a lot more uh, smart information up so that you can analyze that data. Now, it, that can go to which water pipes are going to be replaced before they break. But it's also, this smart data is not just exclusive for a distribution system and water. We are watching wastewater systems and collection systems. We're watching stormwater basins. So you can combine it all and bring that information in and be useful. The way it's, it works is you generally have a central control area. All that information comes in. So all of a sudden, instead of a whole lot of people having desperate pieces of information, you centralize it. There's all kinds of things you can do when you can look at data. And again, you talked about breaking down the silos. You can share that data amongst everybody. So it can all of a sudden open up a lot of ideas. It, it also can then begin to operate the system for you and make you smarter. Um, in some systems, you look at water and it can tell you, I've got a water break. It'll automatically issue a work order to the nearest service crew who's being tracked by GPS and will get there. So it can quickly make the system very effective and it can really cut response time and get you to do things. So it can be very smart about that. But the last but not least is, is the analytics. All of a sudden, we have a project in Australia where we talked about how tight water is. We were able to put off and stave off a capital improvement because it was better use of the data in the field. They knew that a tank in one particular place would solve the problem instead of expanding the plant. So there are ways to use the data effectively. But this is a real change in the water industry. Um, one of my own 
managers came to me and said, man, I want one of these smart meters. It'll read the meters so fast I don't have to send guys out in trucks. You know what the problem was is he didn't get it. <laughs> it wasn't about trying to get the, you know, the meter reads done easier and faster. It was, no, we're going to have all this data. We can look at the rates. We can send a notice out to the customer and say, hey, you must have a leaky pipe. You know, you need to check. We're looking at your meter right now live. Um, it has everything to do with engineering capability. So this really is a change management issue. And, and at Veolia, we've kind of started pursuing change management. With all these interesting ideas, you have to kind of retrain everybody on what it's going to be like. We call that peer performance solutions, but it's a method of helping people change and to deal with the new reality that's going to be in the water industry. And California certainly is leading the way in trying to do conservation and better management of resources, but it's also, it's filtering out to other people, and so we have to help them train. So what we've done is we've tried to develop a change management program for water and wastewater utilities that really can help them make a significant and lasting performance. So it's not one time let's do it, but help them understand what all this new information is going to mean, how they can use it to effectively improve the system in the long term. We do it simply using our knowledge. Um, we talked about P3 on a capital side. Um, this is really a P3 on the intelligence side. Um, we're exchanging information between people's brains, um, less physical uh, attributes now, and more kind of mental, sitting down and talking about how to do things in a different way and think like an entrepreneur, think like a businessman. So those are kind of ways we do it. We do this in a very collaborative approach. Basically, we like to think of ourselves as operators helping operators better understand the system. So we try to do it as a peer. We do it in a collaborative fashion. Um, all at the same time, the utility keeps control of their system. Um, and we also have experimented with what we call performance-based management. It's not enough for you to hire somebody and say, I'm going to save water, or I'm going to save money, or I'm going to make the system more efficient. We like to put our... Uh, say the money where our mouth is. We like to be able to do that based on actually achieving results and getting paid for those results. So uh, how we do that, again, we work side by side, very collaborative. And it is very hands-on that we do work. We're working here in LA right now with some meter uh, effort. Um, we end up doing a lot of performance metrics. Um, somebody said this morning, what gets measured gets managed. Well, we use a lot of scoreboards, dashboards that help people understand what's going on in their system and how to use it. Um, that all becomes very visual. And if, if you were at a Dodgers baseball game, you look on the scoreboard and know the score, that's what we're trying to bring to the operations business. There's always a scorecard. You always know how you're doing. Not just whether you're winning or losing the game, but are you doing well at hitting? Are you doing well at pitching? Have you had errors in the field? Those are the kind of information. And, and that can have some real results. Um, we're seeing very significant results just in better use of workforces, we're seeing results in cost savings, we're seeing better use of meter management to keep the meters accurate and provide good information. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, how, you know, when we talk about technologies like this, uh, privacy always comes to, you know, to, you know, to, the, to, to discussion. How do you guys deal with privacy? Well, I think one of the things is a lot of times when we look at the information, we're looking at all the information in aggregate um, and not so much at individual meters. But you have to become very careful. Once you have all the information on customers, everybody wants to say, oh, I'd like to see that. I may want to sell something. We, we just had this discussion with a client last week um, about, no, you, you need to set boundaries as the, as the utility managers, decide how you're going to use the information, um, how you're going to protect it um, for use. Um, and it's not unusual. In some industries, the use of water or the discharge of wastewater can, can be a competitive. competitive. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an intelligent issue for somebody. True. So you need to set boundaries as a government and decide what's acceptable, how you want to protect that, and go from there. So it's not something to take lightly. Um, the other thing is, is obviously there's all this information stored, and you have to have a way to protect that. So you need to work with um, your computer programs, the, your, your IT departments to make sure that you have the information protected, stored, uh, and set off. So it just needs to be thought out thoroughly on, on what can happen. And I think more of this, uh, this information is collected and grows, I think there's going to be more of that in the water yeah. sector. So we're going to go international. So when we talk about water, we usually don't talk about Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that Canada has the kind of water problems that we have here. But There's nevertheless, uh, Canada has a lot of technology and a lot of good engineering. And, uh, you know, Council General, if you can uh, talk to us about how Canada can help California crisis, 
Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, do I have to get up to move? I don't. Even better. I just wave my hand. <laughs> yeah, that was oh, cool. That's what happens you're, you're, when you're... You're, a, doing oh, much, yeah. you're doing much better with technology. <laughs> you're, a, you're a foreign diplomat. You just do that. <laughs> Some staff deal with you. Um, well, just to put it into context, I, I moved to California a couple of years ago, and um, just hearing and listening about water here is not something that I would have thought about, like our friends you know, talking about other countries. Um, we have water issues, we have climate change issues, um, similar to what the rest of the world is experiencing, but um, we have a lot of water, lots of lakes, rivers, um, it snows a lot, there's a lot of abundance of, of, of the resource. Um, but I will say one thing, we are the largest importer of fruits and vegetables from mm. California in the world. <laughs> With our long winters, you do not go to a grocery store in Canada any time from November to April or even past that where you're not going to be purchasing um, fruits or vegetables from California. So we're very aware of the situation. And I can tell you when your drought uh, accelerates here, uh, our price of purchasing of fruits and vegetables goes up. So it becomes uh, an awareness level of what's happening in California that's high. Um, so anything that we can do to contribute to this, um, to some of the solutions, we want to participate in that. Um, we also uh, represent Nevada, Arizona, and Southern California from this consulate. Um, I can tell you in Arizona, the Canadian water companies are very active. The three largest water companies in Arizona are now owned by Canadian companies, Canadian hmm. water companies. Hmm. Um, and they're actively involving new technologies and, and bringing expertise to, to the ground. Um, if we can go to the first slide. Just wave. Just, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I guess I didn't wave high. I'm like the Queen of England, right? Yeah. So we uh, respect oh. Her Majesty. Go back one, please. Uh, now, you, now you're asking me to go back. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, just our capabilities in, in uh, water and wastewater. So we've had a strong focus on wastewater and management of wastewater and technologies that, that move that forward. Um, just an example, WaterTap, which is a water technology hub in Ontario and Toronto, um, has over 900 companies participating in it. So companies are developing new technologies uh, that are getting supported by our governments and by the private sector to develop new technologies. Um, we are actually going to be here in November with, the, with a series of companies from Canada, with the Metropolitan Water District of SoCal, um, with your tech up here to bring engineers down and others to share technologies and information uh, that will be available uh, to people to use. Um, and we heard a bit about P3s. We've been involved in P3s in Canada for um, well over 20 years, 200 plus examples. And it was not, um, I, I remember there was the, the usual um, you know, tensions between private sector, government, unions, all of the issues that, that create challenges. Um, but we had infrastructure problems that led us to um, uh, the conclusion that in many cases this was the way to go. And so they've all, most of them have been successful and some more than others. Um, just to highlight a couple of examples on the next slide of Canadian water technology. These are two companies that are operating um, here in California. The one on the left is UV Pure. I'm going to actually look at my notes here because I have trouble reading that. Oh. Um, UV Pure is a Toronto-based company operating here. Um, they are experts in water uh, disinfection with over 18,000 installations worldwide. We actually spoke to them earlier this week and um, just a fascinating bit of technology and expansion of, of cleaning water and making it drinkable and usable. Um, it's actually being used at the LA County Incubator. Um, and another interesting piece that they were telling us is that Boeing on the new Dreamliners of the 787 will be using this technology to have um, fresh water on the planes. And, and just when you listen to um, the technology they've come up with, the, um, the possibilities are endless in terms of usage of this technology around the world. Um, and it's the first and only technology that will fulfill its, the NSF's 350 Reese challenge, which was issued um, here in California. Um, so a very interesting use of technology um, here. Um, Horta, the company on the right, is a Quebec-based company. Um, and we had a great conversation with them earlier in the week, too. Uh, they're operating in your, uh, in your fields here, in your agricultural sector, again, important for Canada. Um, water reduction through advanced soil monitoring technology. Um, so what they do is they will measure the soil on a regular basis in terms of the water you're using, which has a couple of things that it does. It actually 
um, measures the tension in the soil so you can actually uh, calibrate the amount of wa water you use, get a better yield, use less water versus just having water uh, not being properly used. They're also launching an automate, automated uh, irrigation system. They'll be collecting data here in California. So both of those companies are just quick examples of how Canadian technology is participating in, in your water situation here in California. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Felicia, you, uh, you heard all of us talking here. I <laughs> saw you taking a lot of notes. So I'm just, uh, you know, wondering whether uh, any ideas uh, stood out to you, uh, you know, as potentially most applicable to challenges facing us. I'm uh, wondering if you would have any question, you know, that you would want more information from people that talked here. No, I thought that was, uh, I think that was great, both because you, you do have such a transformation in thinking, particularly in Southern California, among the urban water agencies, and, um, and I, I, I was pleased that so many people also talked at that human dimension of figuring out how to collaborate, which is easier said than done. Frequently, I know I may uh, sound impatient with folks that talk past each other. I think it actually takes intention and work to not do that and to not get stuck in our silos because we're spending time uh, at work. So that's encouraging. I, I also appreciated that we talked about technology about data, I've become a total data fan in terms of display and being able to show people how we can do things uh, differently. In some ways it makes it feel like we do it by abacus and practice <laughs> rather than um, really looking at some of the visualization tools that can challenge our traditional assumptions. And then I always love listening to Virginia talk about uh, the alternative delivery systems, especially that chart that it shows you that it's about um, government, because government's the one making the decision on whether to do something differently, really thinking about that project and what's the best delivery system. From the easier said than done, I think some of the risk isn't just stakeholders, it's political risk and the risk of making a mistake. That's what gets the headlines. I've been in that situation with a, remember the $6 million boat? Yeah, it was really <laughs> a good boat. But. Um, <laughs> Um, but it was well intended, but it was where a government uh, agency very well intended set out to do a good thing, to build a monitoring vessel, uh, take care of employees, but they weren't boat builders. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the designer and the construction both messed up. And what was the answer? The answer was we should hire yet another consultant to oversee the designer and the boat builders. But if you, in, in the modern era, if you had the choice of going to someone who bore the risk of delivering a uh, monitoring vessel that met certain criteria on time and on budget, and if the risk was on someone else, it would have been a much better situation. And similarly, just seeing how much engineering time was spent arguing over $10,000 change orders, and, uh, and that whole point of the engineers who were designing it not talking to operations. I don't know if, Enrique, we, we had to do a whole series of meetings where the, the two of us who are commissioners in public work had I meet with the senior engineers and sanitation people every quarter to make sure they were talking with each other and they liked each other. So the whole idea <laughs> of figuring out, or at least they said they did, um, uh, and the amount of money that government spends in change orders and doing those fixes later is just uh, crazy. And yet, government doesn't get allowed to go to the conferences that everybody else does. You go to outsiders, they can get you the cutting edge in the world where you can have mm -hmm like the folks in the city of LA, the most talented people and wonderful people I ever worked with, but all they knew was city of LA because they weren't yeah. allowed to go to conferences yeah. or do anything. So yeah. it, it's, uh, I, I just think that I was heartened by what I heard and I think all of those have merit. I think there's a political challenge in figuring out how to have the political leadership to figure out how to do it because everybody can tell you a horror story and so it's as if it was always thus, you know, you try to do a water market somewhere it didn't work and it's, dead forever. I mean, there were things that Jeff and I worked on in the 90s that were a good idea that didn't go that well, so no one wants to go anywhere near it, even though it's still a good idea. But now with data and uh, these different tools, you might be able to try something. So I, I think we have to get more nimble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, Jeff, uh, uh, I know that the MWD, and, y and you've talked about it in the past, has made recent reforms to its open procurement process. You know, if you can talk a little bit about it, your experience, Sure. Well, among the things we've been trying to do, and um, 
and James mentioned the uh, tech hub we've been trying to do. We, we've been trying to get more small businesses because into our pipeline because they tend to be more representative of Southern California. They tend to be local. And so we have done things like we used to have uh, arbitrary limits of $25,000 was the most contract we could do without a bid. And then everything after that had to go to competitive bidding. And we bumped that to $75,000 so that we can bring in uh, more local businesses that way. We also have worked and created a tech hub where we're bringing in outside businesses where they pitch ideas. We have we partnered with Southern Nevada, uh, Central Arizona Project, and other people throughout the Southwest to bring them together to listen to these ideas that we can act as clearing houses and then bring them back to our agencies that are our member agencies and say, you know, this may not be a metropolitan idea. We're a big wholesaler, but it's a terrific product for retailers that then get water for metropolitan. And so then we, we can act as that clearinghouse pipeline bring forward those companies to our member agencies. And it's a kind of service we can do that isn't a typical government service, but something that we can help out throughout Southern California and throughout the Southwest now. And, and, and the success, and well, you, you know, the success of it or what is the experience? Yeah, so the experience has been really good. Our member agencies really like it. Our cities like it in our service area. Uh, we've been able to uh, get some products for ourselves that we've incorporated into our system. Uh, but what we really like is we're getting up to about about something like a third of our, all our contracting dollars are being spent in local firms in Southern California uh, that we no longer look at what we call used to call minority and women-owned business. We're just now focused on small businesses and a large number of disabled yeah. firms and things like that that have really, uh, I, I believe, has really helped all of Southern California. So it's been quite a success. Good. Excellent. That's very good to hear. Uh, and, you know, Enrique, uh, you know, uh, the city and, the, and your department has dealt a lot, uh, you know, put together the low impact development ordinance, uh, LID, and uh, in order to, part of what you are looking for in order to finance, finance it is, uh, is uh, uh, your stormwater mitigation credit trading program. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about, about that, where, we, where are we, how is it going? I will, Jacob, but before I... I, I, I talk about that, let me just remind the Consul General of another Southern California C Canada connection. Uh, just recently, a Canadian company, Santec, acquired a local uh, Pasadena-based company, um, MWH. Montgomery Watts and Herzog. So now oh, really? you, yeah, you I didn't know MWH, that. we're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, Good thing are. Canadians are cool. <laughs> ah, now you're really in the water business. <laughs> and they're all in the engineering world, right. and we've done business with them for a long time. But um, so, so on that very, uh, you know, this is where our interface with the business community and the private sector through the LA Business Council, because this very concept picked the interest of. Uh, Mary, Leslie, and all of the membership in the Business Council about how a market-based model can accelerate the progress in our low-impact development uh, ordinance, which mm -hmm. essentially is regulated-based. It's where we do all that, the stormwater capture at a partial, at a construction development project uh, at the site for compliance with a permit from the Regional Water Quality Control Board, State Water Resources Board, and EPA. All regulator based. Uh, so to have that become a benefit to water supply, uh, which is obviously very important right now, how can we accelerate that? And how can we expand that? Well, what about looking at stormwater capture at a development project that may not be fully suitable either by soil conditions, by space limitations, by other restrictions, but still have some way of incentivizing the developer of doing the right thing by capturing stormwater somewhere else. The somewhere else being in, at another similar project, another construction project in the private sector, or for that matter, in the public space still seizing on the opportunity to capture stormwater, infiltrate, increase the water supply, and the developer still being able to comply with, with the uh, low impact development ordinance, still increasing the water supply. <clears throat> so that's something that we're uh, 
talking about right now. A concept that <laughs> we're talking about right now, uh, and we are very much uh, interested in working with the LA Business Council to sort of mature it and have it develop in a way that makes sense for the private sector and the developing community. Yeah. Good. Uh, Gil, in your, uh, you know, in, in, in your part, in, in your work on uh, on uh, uh, Water One, uh, One Water, what do you see? What do you see room for, you know, partnerships for private sector expertise, investments, and new technologies? Where do you see this coming? Well, I think there's going to. I mean, obviously, the One Water LA is a, is a planning effort, so and a, and a by and large a stakeholder involvement effort and maybe also a, a large uh, communication effort to the, 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 pu the general public uh, because eventually it will cost money so <clears throat> to implement. Uh, in the implementation phase, uh, clearly there's enormous amount of room for public-private partnerships. Um, you, you mentioned the, the, the alternative deliveries. I know there are some projects right now in the city, for instance, that uh, are looking at um, regional recycled water that would serve many um, public and private uh, customers. Uh, customers, I was, I was going to say, are very anxious to see that happen, which is an interesting thing. I mean, uh, we, we've seen these sectors, you know, react, but now they're very proactive. So to meet the time schedule, to meet the financial uh, needs um, and expediting the, the projects, I see a lot of uh, public-private partnership opportunities there. That's one example. The technologies uh, for data and uh, reporting, I think there's, uh, I mentioned the communication piece and, the, and getting back to the stakeholders and the public. I think everybody's interested in uh, almost live information and uh, we see a lot of concepts uh, built around dashboards that uh, managers and politicians and representatives can, can use uh, at the fingertip. Um, so these kind of associations I think are just a couple examples, but. Virginia, maybe uh, also for you. I mean, I'm just, I just wonder potential market opportunities in California that you know that uh, would be of interest uh, to you know two persons in the public-private partnerships. Uh, what what do you see? Sure. In the well, I think um, at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is some three really neat words: innovation, uh, collaboration, and choices. I don't know about you all, but I like to have choices. I really like to have choices. And the, and the reason I like to have choices is because I definitely believe that one size does not fit all and that you should innovate and adapt and adjust as you're accomplishing your objective. And if your objective is to build a $30 million pump station, well, I think we know how to build $30 million pump stations. We do them pretty well, and I think a traditional process works very well at that. But if you're going to build a close to billion dollar intra-agency regional treatment facility with pipelines going through all kinds of different communities, uh, incorporating different construction means and methods and having significant sequencing and logistics issues, don't you want to look at the different choices and the different options you would have to be able to implement that? And that's really what we're talking about here Whether today, whether we're talking about let's look at our choices and do an integrated recycled water project across all of LA County. Um, let's incorporate low impact design in it. Uh, let's incorporate some innovation data gathering in it. No, oh, by the way, let's figure out how to protect our critical infrastructure through you know, cybersecurity on it. Um, having all of those choices, why would you stop at the delivery model? <laughs> it would seem to me that it makes sense to carry that creativity through to how are we actually going to dig the dirt and, and bolt it together. And then the next step would be, at the same time, would you, does it make sense, does it benefit uh, the project 
to bring in alternative financing mechanisms. Again, if we're looking at this example, you have multiple agencies involved, you have multiple uh, partners. Maybe you're going through, uh, it makes some sense to partner with a piece of heavy industry or heavy industry, uh, and they want to help construct it to achieve some of their sustainability goals. Because as you say, you know, we in the corporate world uh, have core values, and one of ours at Parsons is sustainability. And so we would like to participate in that project. Well, would you really wanna turn that opportunity away as the public entity building the project? So wouldn't you like to have the ability to incorporate that in. And that's, and that's what alternative delivery is. And, and that's, uh, you know, and, and again, and that's, the, I think, what we're talking about here in terms of water supply is as we move forward, as Felicia said, everything's on the table. It's, it's a bunch of puzzle pieces all over the place. We're gonna put it together different, differently. We're gonna be really creative how we put it together. We're gonna innovate. We're gonna learn some new things. We're gonna have fun, right? And, and incorporating our delivery mechanisms into that conversation, I think is uh, not only smart, but I think our public policy folks have a responsibility yeah. to inc incorporate that into their thinking. I, I'm putting in my application. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, t Rob, tell us a little, tell us about the project that you talk, you, you told us about working with LADW, tell us about uh, a project, an agency, a place that really is advanced in, in the kind of in the kind of smart water systems that you are talking about, and and what what do you see, and how did they, how did they get to where they are? Well, I think one of the our test sites is actually in Europe, um, in France, and by installing the information, they're starting to work through all the details of it. But it got so sophisticated that when not only can you tell there's a leak, can you bring in the meter data, but when there was a call of a problem to a dispatcher, the dispatcher actually hooked into the transportation system TV cameras and was able to say, oh, we're going to need wreckers to go with them because there's three cars getting flooded. They actually were watching the event live. Mm -hmm. and, and it, I mean, I manage distribution crews. It changes the dynamics of the water system. Not only did it, the system call and say, I've got a break, um, you know, not only did it say these are the closest trucks to be there, but all of a sudden you can look at it live and say, wow, this, this is what we're facing, you know, we've got this. All of a sudden, the, the dispatcher and the supervisor were able to immediately do that. Um, it, it really provided information. The, the other thing, though, that it does is it just tells you so much about the system and you start thinking in terms of engineering. Um, all this information, do I need a plant, do I need a tank? Um, you also know when water is needed, can you pump off peak, use less expensive energy, do it at a time from that standpoint. And, and then it opens up all kinds of conversations about customer information from the standpoint of if somebody's watering their lawn in the heat of the day, should they pay a demand charge? Is this like, does water become like electricity? Well, you're going to water, it's going to evaporate, you're actually wasting water. Do we actually apply that into a charge? that changes the dynamics of, uh, of how the customer is going to act and go from there. So I think there's a lot of things to explore on that goes on, and that's what we're finding with the ones we've got in place. That's, a, that's great. So, you know, we have only a few more minutes. What I want to do is maybe ask everybody, uh, you know, what would you like to see happen next year and in the next five years? What do you see? What would you like if you had your, your way here? Yeah. Well, the, the panel is about partnerships, so um, I, I actually am going to say that I'm pretty uh, en enthused and excited about the, the level of partnership that's been created. Some of those projects, you know, started with maybe contention and uh, assumed or perceived or real, and I, I really see a, a very um, powerful trend to get over this and get on with the program. So I hope this continues the next year and the following. I'd like to see a lot of rain, and then, I'd like to, <laughs> and then I'd like everyone to say, in the policy debate, to say, that's good, but we still have an oh. issue, and we still need to keep working. Amen. That Absolutely. I'd like to see California finally stop arguing north, south, ag, urban, and say, let's just, it's good enough, let's pick a solution, uh, say to our Delta crisis, good enough, <laughs> let's do it, and we're going to implement it, and not everyone's going to be happy, but let's just get it done. 
I, I think the idea of one water, it, it's not drinking water over here and wastewater and storm water, it's water. And so we just tr start treating it as one resource. So I think the plan here going forward looks good. James? Um, well, I, one, I don't want to see it rain. I love living here. So <laughs> I'm the greatest foreign post in the Canadian government. Has. <laughs> <laughs> we never tell anybody in Ottawa, it's, I'm from the backyard. And it's like, no pictures, please. Um, <laughs> But I, I think just listening to this today, I, it's obviously we're in a, a global world, and I do say that because you've referenced Australia, you've referenced um, Israel, and I think countries like Canada and others can participate in the solutions, and we can also learn from the things you're doing mm -hmm. here too. So it was a very, uh, very good session. Thank you. Thank you. Henry? So amen to the comment on the one water, uh, but what, what I'm going to speak as an implementer now. Uh, Felicia, so what I see in this First, next year, I see us doubling up our production of recycled water at our Truman Island Water Reclamation Plant. That's going up by 100% by December of this year. That's going to happen. Uh, in the next five years, we're going to produce another 70 million gallons of, of daily uh, recycled water at another water reclamation plant. And then I would like, also like to see in the next five years a countywide strategy for green infrastructure, which um, I, I believe is... It's starting to happen. Yep. Good. Felicia? Amen to all of those. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I just want to see stuff on the ground that people can see and touch, whether it's their turf being out, there are more stormwater projects. I mean, that when you go and see the however many there are, the 20-something that you all have been working on for a long time, and you think about the partnership now with LADWP and the county, all three of you actually working together, I just want to see more of those little projects because I think that creates a visualization that people can see, not just of a more sustainable water future for the LA area, but a more sustainable LA area. Yep. Excellent information. Thank you. You know, thank let's you. Uh, thank the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>